Hi everyone, I'm Chris Bachman, I'm the faculty advisor at Calcutta LA for the Baja and Formula SAE teams. I'm putting together a short video here on some of the fundamentals and design of the powertrain system. So this powertrain system includes the engine, its auxiliaries, the electronics to control the engine, and everything between the engine and the wheels. So I'm going to start off by going over some uh, engine fundamentals, and then I'll start about some specifics for FSAE um, and uh, getting air in and out of their engines, and then talk a little bit about drivetrain specific to Baja Formula C. So feel free to skip around to what's most useful and relevant for you. So first off, what's the overall objectives of your powertrain system? So first off, you're trying to maximize the forward longitudinal force that you can provide to your vehicle in order to help it, one, accelerate uh, as much as possible and to travel as fast as possible. And because those two, because those two things will really determine uh, a lot of your a lot of your lap time when you combine it with the addition of cornering. Um, for for formula especially, you want to minimize the fuel consumption as this is a scored category. Also, it's the means you have to carry around less fuel as you go, it makes you lighter. And with all the other subsystems, they're always supporting your overall vehicle requirements. So you know, in this case, you might want to reduce the overall overall the mass, maybe the size, lower the center of gravity with your system. And you might ask yourself, do you need a differential? Can you just use a spool? How will that affect your handling and what you need to do in your suspension? You might also might also ask, you know, would you rather have you know high power at specific RPMs or you know medium power over a wider range? So we have to think about how this supports your overall vehicle requirements. But let's get into it. So the four-stroke internal combustion engines which most of these teams are using. Their primary purpose is they take in air and fuel and they output rotational motion at this um, crankshaft down at the bottom. How this works, let's start with the air coming in. The air comes through an air cleaner to filter out any of the debris that you're not gonna to want to get inside your engine. It's going to, in this case, this is an older picture, it shows it getting mixed with the carburetor. This is still true on the Briggs and Stratton engine. And this carb and this uh, carburetor uh, is going to mix the air and fuel together at the right ratios. You typically, have a throttle plate between those two to limit how much air comes in and connects to your throttle pedal. Uh, on Formula SA vehicles, typically you're going to have a fuel injector near near your inlet valve or actually inside your engine. This fuel is going to travel down. This engine is obviously has four different cylinders in it in this cutaway. And then it has an inlet and exhaust valve on each one to let the fresh charge in and then let the spent charge come back out. And so this camshaft along here is going to be connected to your crankshaft so it can time when to open these valves for the air to come inside the engine. You'll notice actually it's twice as big as the, as the output and that's because this will have to spin twice as fast. It's one thing to keep in mind when you have cam and crank sensors sensing their RPMs and timing these things. And as this air comes in, it's going to have a spark plug inside the chamber as well to ignite it and to drive these pistons down. And so these components here are the pistons that inside the cylinders, and they're connected to the crankshaft through a connecting rod, which is going to drive this rotational motion. Uh, you're also going to have uh, oil to lubricate this whole system as you want to minimize friction, and you're going to have a way to distribute that oil uh, throughout the engine. A lot of times on both of these teams, we're not looking into the details um, of modifying a lot of the geometry or components inside the engine. We look at it typically more as a black box, looking at the power and torque curves. And so what these are is looking at the output power of the engine and torque as a function of the RPM or the rotational speed. And so um, and these are very related to each other because the power is just the product of torque times speed. And you just gotta be careful with your units. And so ideally, you know, this black is the power and it's going to, with this rather flat, flat torque curve, this is a formula SA example, because it's gonna get multiplied by the speed as you increase the speed, this power is gonna slowly go up until it reaches its peak. 
And ideally, you want this to be as high as possible and as wide as possible. And you're going to want to operate, as you've seen in some of our previous videos, operate uh, in this range as possible. And so having this as wide as possible will allow you to operate at a high power for as, for as much of the time around the track as possible, which would be ideal. So let's get into a little more of the details of what's going on inside the combustion chamber. So um, first, we're just going to briefly go over the four strokes and some of the uh, some definitions. So you have this piston is going to travel up and down as it rotates on the crankshaft from BC or sometimes bottom center or BDC, bottom dead center to top center. The volume that's up above when the piston's at the top center is the clearance volume. The volume that it goes up and down is the displaced volume and the total volume is just the total volume. So you're going to go through four phases over and over again in the engine in order to produce power. So the first one is the piston starts at the top, and as you see, it's traveling down right now with the inlet valve open, exhaust valve closed, sucking air and potentially fuel in. Um, the only case with that, where that wouldn't be the case is where if you have a direct injection fuel inside, where um, where you might be waiting until later in the later in the process to inject the fuel in, um, and then after you've sucked all the fresh air and fuel in. Then you're going to drive this up and compress it into a small space as the inlet valve close before you uh, the inlet valve close during this compression process. Once right before you reach the top or close to where you stop, a spark's going to go off. It's going to drive the piston back down, generating the power this whole time. So both of these strokes actually consumed power. It took work to do it. This is where you get the power back out, and then you had to after it's driven back down the exhaust valve will open and it'll push out the burnt fuel and air to repeat over and over again and get the fresh air in and out so this is the four cycles again and we actually will usually label this based on the crank position and so top dead uh, center being zero and going around 360 degrees passing through 180 at the bottom uh, more commonly i actually see this go through zero to 720, but you could also do negative 360 to 360, going from top center where you have the lowest volume and the volume will increase and decrease sinusoidally. And you'll see around this, around this uh, zero degrees um, between the, these two figures right here, but during the expansion and closer to the top, you're actually gonna burn all of your fuel. So what you're gonna find in this case is this is a pressure now versus crank angle position is at first you're going to have this IVO stands for inlet valve open and exhaust valve close or open. So initially the inlet valve is gonna open a little bit early actually and the exhaust valve is gonna close a little bit late. So this is your valve overlap. And then you're going to begin sucking in air all the way until the inlet valve closes, which is actually after bottom dead center. And then you're gonna come up and you're going to spark a little before top dead center. And so typically it would follow these dashed lines. There was no combustion, but you have fuel that can burn. You get this high pressure, high pressure peak. And then as the cylinder begins to expand and you're done burning, the pressure is going to drop back all the way down until your exhaust valve begins to open, which can happen before. And then it's going to come all the way, exhaust, 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 until you repeat the process over and over again. So another thing that I didn't mention here is this stroke to bore ratio, uh, the design of engine. So, so you'll notice that at a certain RPM that the, that the piston, when it's at 90 degrees, is gonna be traveling omega r velocity up. And this r is gonna be related to half of the stroke. So the bigger stroke you have, what that means is for a fixed RPM, the piston actually has to travel at a larger velocity. And so, what you'll, what you'll typically find is that for, you know, racing engines, you'll actually have a, a larger bore to stroke, you know, maybe, you know, 1.5 to two and a half times. Um, and the other advantage is when your bore gets really big, this gets wide, and that gives you really a lot of room for big, for big inlets and outlets to be able to exchange the air in and out effectively. So performance engines usually have a larger bore than stroke, and you can go down to more square engines if you want higher efficiency. Usually higher efficiencies will happen with larger, larger strokes. And so in order to analyze these systems, 
as engineers, which I assume most people are watching this, we like to look at the pressure and the volume and plot them against, against each other. So that's taking these two graphs and combining them. So what you'll happen here is you'll see initially we're going to have the pressure is going to rise because, because we're compressing right here. We're going to compress here to here and about here is where the spark happens and you're going to have this drastic increase in pressure to you know, above 30 times the atmospheric pressure. And then you're going to have the end of, end of the combustion and begin to expand expansion stroke, getting all your power out here. So you get all the way to here where you're going to begin to do some of your exhaust. And so you're going to drive the gases out. So you're driving going to smaller volumes and then you're going to suck them back in. And so just as um, you might know that work is the integral of force times displacement, if we multiply displacement by area and divide pressure by area or divide force by area, we get the work is also the integral of pressure and volume or you've taken some thermo. And so you'd realize that the integral is the area. So this top area is all positive work. So you want to do as much work as you can. That's going to end up driving your car forward. And this part down here is called pumping losses. And this is actually negative work. So and that's because the slightly higher pressure during the exhaust and the intake. So you can get rid of this with a supercharger or a turbocharger and get rid of some of your pumping losses. Um, and one way we categorize this whole area is we take this, this positive area, subtract this negative area, and then we try and fit a rectangle. And so and the height of this rectangle at this volume is called the indicated mean effective pressure. And so that's a that gives you a sense of how much work um, work uh, your engine can do. And it's also nice because it's, um, it's normalizes it per the volume. So it's a fair comparison between engines of different volumes. And indicated just means this is inside the cylinder, whereas brake means what's coming out of the engine. So it includes friction losses and that sort of thing associated with all the bearings and moving parts in the engine. And so and you can basically find this whole area is now the work is just the indicated mean effect pressure times the displaced volume. So it makes this relationship rather simple. So like engineers do, we try and, we try and model this um, system. And so we model this as the auto cycle. And so the auto cycle, what it has is it has, they assume no heat transfer and no, no losses. So it's completely in thermodynamics to say it's reversible. And so, and you'll have, that process from one to two being the compression, you have a constant volume expansion modeling the combustion process. And then you have, again, a no heat transfer and uh, no losses. So reversible um, expansion process, constant, uh, constant uh, volume down to your exhaust pressure. And then you just have constant pressure and a constant volume exchange. And so this is kind of a the kind of a model of what's actually happening. The nice part about that is you can look at how how the fundamental parameters of the engine might affect things like your fuel efficiency. So the fuel efficiency, what you want to do is maximize the work out, how much heat energy you put in, or how much fuel energy you put in. And so, and this is can be found this relationship with the compression ratio and the ratio of specific heat. So it's just, just around 1.4. So the compression ratio is the ratio of the total volume to the clearance volume. And so you imagine that you want to have that clearance volume to be as small as possible, although you do have to miss the valves and any fuel injector and any spark plug that's in there. And you can get a higher, higher fuel efficiency. So what that looks like is here's kind of these theoretical curves, never mind the different parameters, but you can see roughly the fuel efficiency, which sorry, that's a little blurry there. So this is fuel efficiency is going to raise and raise with compression ratio. So the uh, compression ratio, if we just go back to the engine a little bit, it's just this, you want a really large total volume compared to this clearance volume. So, and that can get you as high as a fuel efficiency as possible. And so these are the theoretical values and these dotted lines are experimental values you see, you know, and that gives you a range of thermal efficiencies, you know, from 30s to 45. Okay, so to understand a little more about the engines, I think we have to look a little bit about um, combustion chemistry, because in the end, we want to say, well, how much can we really, how much power could we potentially get out of these, get out of these engines? What's limiting us? So if we look down, 
gasoline, we usually model with this isooctane molecule. So eight carbon, 18 hydrogen, and we have to mix it with air. So air has a mix of oxygen and nitrogen. And when you combust it or burn it, you're going to be splitting up this hydrocarbon into water and carbon dioxide. And the nitrogen's just along for the ride. So ideally, if you want to have even more power, you just feed your engine pure oxygen. But air's free, uh, doesn't take any weight to carry it around, so you just wouldn't do that. And this is what's called stoichiometric. So you've burned it just perfectly. You don't have any left over. You don't have any leftover um, gasoline, and you don't have any leftover oxygen. It got mixed perfectly. You can also do the same thing for ethanol. So this is ethanol. So ethanol already carries some oxygen along, along with it. And so you actually need less air for the amount of ethanol that you have. And so one thing that we look talk a lot about for these engines is the air to fuel ratio. And so you can do that on a per mole basis for gasoline, which we modeled with isoctane or ethanol. And as you'd expect, you can mind moles is just like saying a dozen. It's just an Avogadro's number of these molecules. So on a molar basis, you need um, more uh, you need more air compared to fuel for for gasoline, and also on a mass basis because because these molecules weigh different amounts. On a mass basis, you also need more uh, air uh, relative to the fuel for gasoline. So you might think in this case that for well, for a formula engine, we're completely limited by the air we can get into the engine with the restrictor. So it seems like it'd be great to put in some oxygen through our gas stream with ethanol. So, um, you know, people, uh, people who run the event figured, figured this out. And, uh, and there's two reasons why you're not going to get, you know, drastically larger performance. One, the energy density of the fuel. So this is Q, this is the energy content, and this is the lower heating value, which is just the difference between, you know, you have higher heating values and lower heating values, which just whether you assume the water is liquid or gas coming out. So we assume it's gas coming out because it's such high temperatures. And so the energy content of ethanol is much lower. And they've also made the, the restrictor smaller uh, for the ethanol case, so you can get less, less air in. But um, a, good, a good, prac uh, I don't know, um, good practice for anyone new to doing engines, you could even calculate the theoretical maximum power put of your engine. Um, if you assume that the air going through this restrictor is going at the speed of sound, and then using some analysis to figure out how much fuel would be able to be burnt with that amount of air, the energy content of the fuel, and make some assumptions about the engine efficiency, you could see what are maybe some theoretical best engine powers that you need. Whether you need that much power or not, it's another question. So we talked a little bit about these air to fuel ratios. And so you'll see this, um, this uh, um, equivalence ratio phi, which is actually, the, you can just think about it as the fuel to air ratio compared to when it's, compared to when it's uh, stoichiometric. So at one, you're doing perfectly stoichiometric. At 1.2, you have 20% more fuel than you need. Uh, 0 0.8, you, you have less fuel than you need. And sometimes you'll see for like control algorithms for engines, they'll actually measure, they'll have lambda sensors. So they'll measure the inverse, the inverse of this. But let's just look at this graph here and this indicated mean effective pressure, right? Which is how much work you can get out. You can see this dotted line is what you, what you find. And you find that the peak actually happens when you put in a little more fuel. And that's just because you're making sure you're using all of the oxygen in this case. Although you're not gonna be as efficient. Being efficient, you're actually gonna wanna push it and actually make sure all of your fuel gets burnt. So if you want more power, you gotta make sure all of your oxygen gets burnt. Uh, if you wanna make sure you're more fuel efficient, you wanna make sure all of your fuel gets burnt and none of it gets wasted. So let's talk about just a few equations here on this and let's and just to give us an idea of the important parameters for the engine. So if we said this fuel efficiency is this power over the heat input. So and you wanna maximize how much power you get out for how much heat you put in. The power you get is how much work you do, which is you do get for every every single time uh, you do four of the strokes and you're actually going to have two revolutions for every time you get four strokes so that's why it's rpm over two so the power is just how much work you can get which is why you want to maximize the um, indicated mean effect pressure and the displaced volume and RPM. and how much uh, heat energy you put in it's just the flow rate of the fuel 
times the energy content of the fuel. So just rearranging this, you can see that to maximize, to maximize the power, we want to maximize the fuel efficiency, how much fuel we can get in, and the energy content of that fuel. Of course, we cannot put in unlimited amount of fuel, right? Because we can only get in so much air in and out of these cylinders. And we're fixed at a certain air to fuel ratio. So here, we realize it's more about how much air you can get in. When we look at how much air we can get in, it's really about just how much does it suck in as it goes down. So for every the flow rate of air is really based on the RPM divided by two again times the displaced volume. But pretend like you're in that valve's closed, obviously you wouldn't get that much air in. So there is some correction factor called the volumetric efficiency, uh, eta v. This eta, eta v accounts for things like losses in your intake system, uh, not being able to get all of your exhaust gases back out because in order to get fresh air in, you have to get the burnt gases back out. So that's kind of a correction factor that we use and we use it to measure the performance of our intake and exhaust systems. So now when we put these all together, we see that the power is related to some things that we really can't, can't control. The density at the, at the, the, dense, the atmospheric density of air that's controlled to air fuel ratio, we can't control that. Um, but things we can change is we can increase the displaced volume. We can try and run at higher RPMs, um, you know, using higher bore to stroke ratio and use higher energy content fuel. And we can increase getting air in and out, getting air in and out of the system by increasing the volumetric efficiency. And we can increase the fuel efficiency, um, one by limiting, you know, heat transfer out of the system uh, by, by uh, increasing the compression ratio. Although you got to be careful when you increase the compression ratio, you might have heard of knock. What will happen? What you can what you can have happen there is um, if you have too much of a compression ratio, as you compress it, the your fuel and air mixture will heat up, and it can begin to combust, not starting at the at the spark plug, but in other areas, and that'll be really damaging to your engine. All right, so let's talk about the volumetric efficiency. We haven't talked about that much yet. So looking at our the system that goes before our intake. Typically, we have our cylinder, and we're going to usually fix a runner, a plenum. Before that, you'll have your throttle body and your carburetor and your, and your restrictor. And so let's think about, well, how big should the plenum volume be? Well, when you think about it, your engine isn't always pulling in air as fast as it, as fast as it can. And if you have a one-cylinder engine, it's only pulling in air one quarter of the time. So you don't want to be pulling air through your restrictor only one quarter of the time. You want to be pulling air through your restrictor at all times if you can and as fast as possible. So what you do is you have this plenum volume as somewhat of a buffer. So you draw from the plenum occasionally, but you can constantly fill this plenum and you're ready to pull that from your cylinder. So what you typically find is that the volumetric efficiency, so this is a 600cc four cylinder engine, and this would be even more drastic for a one cylinder engine, that the higher the plenum volume, the more power you're going to get and the higher volumetric efficiency that you're going to get. Of course, patching a six liter plenum volume can be quite tough. The other issue that you can find is that if your throttles close and you need to open your, your throttle up and then feed your cylinder, there's going to be some lag. And so it makes your system a little bit slower to, to throttle response. Although, you know, I think in the you know, typical, you know, three, three liter plenum volumes, uh, you'll be fast enough. That's maybe just some considerations on the, on you know how you're picking your plenum volume, but and it has a lot to do with you know packaging as well, and also routing. You want everything to be straight and no sharp bends in these systems. So let's talk next about the plenum volume. Let's talk about maybe the length or area of the runners. Both of these will have an effect. So oftentimes we talk about resonance in these systems, and there's a lot of different names. There's you know ramming and uh, inertial effects and um, I get pretty confused when I read the literature on this. It seems like there's kind of two potential phenomena. One is a, a cusic um, resonance. And so what happens there is as the intake valve opens and the piston begins to come down, you have a low pressure pulse that initiates at the cylinder. This low pressure pulse will travel at the speed of sound, come to this open chamber, and it'll, because it's open, it will reflect back as a high pressure wave. And you have a high pressure wave that comes back down. And what you want is this piston is going to travel fastest as it's going through the center of the stroke. And then it's going to slow down near the edges just because it's traveling in an arc. And so at the end here, it's actually slowing down a bit. And so you, 
at that very end, you're going to want this high pressure to come and push a little bit extra in when the piston's not traveling as fast as it was initially. And you can wait, let it bounce a few times even, this pressure wave. But what you'll end up finding is that the longer you make this, it's going to be better, your, it's, it's going to be better at lower RPMs because it's um, going to, it's going to be a little bit slower to go all the way up and down. And so what you find with when you have this pipe or this runner is that you're going to shift the peak power to um, lower, because uh, this is volumetric fish, you're going to see, you're going to move your peak power to lower and lower um, engine RPMs. And what, uh, what I've typically seen in literature is that the bigger the pipe, you, the longer the pipe you have, actually the better. Um, and that's because there's just more inertia in the system. The other potential resonance, resonance effect that you have is called Helmholtz resonance. And that's because you have this large volume and you have this long tube and another large volume. And so for in hydraulics, these large volumes act a little bit like a spring in a mechanical system. That's because you have these large volumes so you can stuff some air in and, in and out of them. And uh, in these long tubes, once the air gets moving, it doesn't like to stop. And so these act more like inertia, so like a mass. So you actually kind of have like a spring mass spring system. And if you've seen spring mass systems, they will have a resonance. And you can, if you can tune the driving function, which is the RPM in this case, to the resonance, you can sometimes excite the system um, uh, and have you know, large, large amplitudes, or in this case, large, large flow rates. And, but you'll have the same phenomena, same phenomena here. Um, that longer pipes will generate generate this uh, power at lower at lower engine RPM. So, and you're going to see these uh, these same phenomena a lot. They talk more about the acoustic phenomena at the exhaust as well, and timing these timing these um, acoustic waves uh, as well as this uh, Helmholtz effect. And so, look up Helmholtz resonators if you want to learn a little bit more about this. So now that we've talked the bit about internal combustion engine fundamentals and the different parameters to think about in terms of optimizing its performance. Let's talk a little bit about uh, tuning the engine. Uh, so and that involves uh, modifying the control of the engine. So your engine's gonna have what's called an engine control unit or ECU, which is um, a computer which will take in different inputs and use those to determine what should the outputs be. Uh, and the outputs that it's controlling are the uh, fuel injector, when those spray, how long they spray for, in addition to when your spark plugs are gonna fire. The things that your ECU is gonna take in is information from the combustion process and the ex from the exhaust. So this lambda sensor will sit in your exhaust and it's gonna measure whether the combustion products are lean or rich. And so remember lambda is your, uh, your air to fuel equivalence ratio from, from earlier. You're gonna have a manifold absolute pressure sensor, so MAP sensor. So this is um, similar to like throttle position. So when you have high manifold pressure, that means your throttle's open. When you have low manifold pressure, that means your throttle's closed. You have your crank position sensor, and you could also have a cam position sensor. Uh, the crank position sensor will give you one, it'll give you RPM, and it'll also tell you at which phase of the engine cycle you're currently you're currently in. With only the crank position, it's a little hard because you don't know if you're in the zero to 360 or 360 to 720. And so, uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind and one advantage of having a cam position sensor. And you might have something like a temperature sensor and you know, keep in mind this can be, there can be a lot, lot more, but these are just maybe the four most common. And what those are gonna do is inside of your engine control unit, you're going to have you're going to have lots of tables. And so what tuners are gonna do is they're gonna modify these tables. And so these tables are gonna have, be based on several inputs. So here, this is like your map sensor versus your RPM, which would come off your crank position sensor. And this will determine things like your air to fuel ratio. there will also be one for your volumetric efficiency and one for your spark timing. So the spark timing is relatively easy. It's gonna come in, measure your, measure your uh, manifold pressure, which will get you this row. So if it's wide open throttle, um, then it's gonna come up here. Keep in mind, this would be a spark timing. So it'd be a table in degrees before top dead center typically. And then it'll measure the RPM. It'll get the value and then it'll defines where it's at. 
you're going to use the crank position sensor to have the spark plug fire, you know, a few degrees before top dead center, whatever is in the table. And you can modify that to try and optimize the performance of your engine. So then it's going to do a similar thing for the injectors. So it's going to take in some information about the manifold pressure and the RPM, and it's going to have a table for volumetric efficiency. And so you'll know that each time that the piston goes down, you're going to suck in the displaced volume multiplied by the volumetric efficiency. And so usually that table for the volumetric efficiency, you want to measure that on something like a flow bench. And after that, what it's going to do is it knows, okay, well, how much air is in there? Now it wants to figure out how much fuel should go in. So what it does, it comes into this table for the air fuel ratio. And so it figures out, you know, it's wide, wide open throttle and, you know, 6,000 RPM, it's going to go to an air fuel ratio of 12.2, which is lower than, you know, the around the 14.9 that we said was stoichiometric. So this will be somewhat rich. And it's going to figure out how long should it keep the injector open in order to achieve that uh, air to fuel ratio. And it can also use the Lambda sensor to do some control feedback. So if it sees it's trying to get 12.2, but it's not quite there, it can uh, adjust those values. So, and so you'll see, and there's different, there's different um, kind of areas of this graph for different, uh, for different things to be doing. So the wide open throttle, right? That'll, I said, sorry again, so just, so the wide open throttle. So that's when you have very high manifold pressures because your throttle plate's open and you'll see you'll run quite a bit rich here. So that'll help you uh, get, uh, that'll help you uh, maximize the power output of your engine, although you're not going to be as efficient. And then you'll see in your cruising, you're going to go quite a bit, quite a bit lean for high fuel efficiency, and so and so forth. And you know, a lot of a lot of kind of you know improving you know engine improvements have come from just more control over the different parameters of your engine under different scenarios to really optimize it. A lot of previously, a lot of these things were mechanically linked and it was hard to have things, different timings and so forth. You know, used to, you used to have a vacuum line that would change your, you know, advance your timing when, uh, as you're, as you're uh, pushing on the gas pedal or opening the throttle plate. Um, but these days uh, with more electronic control, you can, you know, uh, inject fuel at any time you want. You can spark at any time you want based on the conditions. And, you know, and, you know, in the future, you know, to even give you further control, it's like you could, completely control the valve timing uh, to anything you want based on based on the engine conditions. And you even see engines now where, you know, before all the pistons would be linked, you have pistons, which certain pistons, which would turn off under different occasions or, you know, different valves that just completely turn off under different occasions. So, you know, a lot of advancements are kind of not, you know, trying to optimize everything for, for the current condition and not having certain things be linked to each other that don't necessarily always want to be linked. Hopefully this gives you some idea about, you know, what you're going to have to uh, be thinking about uh, as you're trying to really dial in the performance of, of your engine. And, you know, this is typically changed around while your uh, engine's on a dyno or your car might be on a chassis dyno, uh, trying to op optimize, you know, the power output or, you know, smoothness during shifting, um, any of these, any of these things. So next I want to get a little bit into the drivetrain, drivetrain systems and connecting connecting the output of your engine uh, to your wheels. So I'll use a picture of this Baja vehicle from Perez et al. So what you have here is we're gonna start with the engine torque. So the torque coming out of the engine and this torque is gonna go through a transmission. So in the Baja case, it's usually a CVT, which goes through you know, ratios of four to, four to one uh, down near to one to one. In the case of a formula car, typically it'll be a gearbox. And then you're going to have, in the Baja case, a, a fixed gear reduction, so your gearbox. In the Formula case, more often than not, you'll see an output sprocket um, that'll get your final reduction. And then to convert from these torques to the longitudinal force, so this force on the tire driving you forward, you just divide by the radius of the tire. So what you'll find, if we look at the RPM of your engine as you accelerate to higher and higher velocities, because they're all mechanically linked, there's a relationship between your engine RPM and the velocity that you're going. And it has to do with the gear ratios. So if you're not familiar with gear ratios, uh, check those out. But I'm assuming everyone will be familiar with what a gear ratio is of the transmission and either your gearbox or your sprocket and the radius of your tire and the conversion from revolutions to radians. And because they're fixed, what you'll notice is that initially your, 
you're not going to be able to be fully engaged in the gear. And so you're gonna have some slipping either in your CVT or in your clutch until you get up to a certain speed or you're now in first gear. So come up, you're gonna come up into first, first gear and you're gonna accelerate through first gear until you get to too high of an RPM where you're losing power, where you're gonna shift down immediately into second gear. And you'll notice first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth gear, follow these diagonal lines, the slope of those being these terms over here on the right. So the larger gear ratios, the steeper these curves will, steeper these curves will be. And you'll shift all the way down as you accelerate, trying to stay as close to peak power as possible until either you um, reach your top speed because your engine is power limited and you're going too fast, or if you don't gear it quite right, you might be in your sixth gear. Like imagine trying to go to top speed in first gear if you didn't have enough gears. But you get so high where your engine starts to go out of its peak power range and you'll be limited by your drivetrain. So that'd be one thing you want to make sure doesn't happen in your system if you want to hit top speed, although how important that is in formula, I'm not so sure. Um, Baja can reach top speed more often than the endurance event. So one thing you'll notice is that, um, is that you have these six gears and you also notice that typically the later gears will be more tightly spaced than, the, than these first couple of, first couple of gears. So uh, on these plots. So if we then look at, okay, well, how does that affect what we're, what we want, which is the most attractive force. So the most force pushing us forward or that force on the tire. And so I've done this first, this GRC is just the gear ratio of the sprocket or chain here. I just pick, pick kind of a medium value. You can see it is also related to the torque of the engine. And so initially you're limited by traction. So we'll go look at our drive dynamics video I haven't seen it yet. And then you're gonna get into your gears. And you'll see this you know, kind of small flip here just has to do with this model having um, some weight shift where you have more weight shift and then you can accelerate more. But um, and what you'll notice is that this will, this, you'll follow this kind of theoretical curve, which is that really the most force you can do is really to the power of your engine divided by the velocity. So this is a one over V type relationship. And so the more gears you have, the closer you can stay to this curve for longer. Um, and so, some design considerations with this is that one, you know, you might not use all six gears, and uh, and so you might choose three. And so if you choose the first three or the later three, that would really affect the gear ratio of your sprocket. So it's uh, this GRC. Um, and so changing this gear ratio of your sprocket, you can see if it's very low. Your shift points will be at high speeds. If it's very high, your shift points are going to be at lower speeds, and it's going to put everything closer to closer together as well. And you can, you know, do simulations with different spark ratios, see how it affects your lap times, or in this case, just a, you know, roughly uh, in a simulation of your acceleration event, which one can give you the fastest acceleration time. Although, you know, some of these, some of these uh, time difference might be outweighed by other phenomena or other overall vehicle considerations. So if we look at the same thing for the Baja vehicle, here's kind of a gearbox ratio of eight we're roughly looking at. You're going to have, in, in this case with the CVT, you have this same relationship. Um, so for the transmission of the CVT and you're using the gear fixed ratio of the gearbox. So initially you can have this uh, clutching phase where it's slipping. So you're going to get into the low gear ratio, you know, around four. And you're going to travel with that until you get to your shift RPM. And at this point, you're going to have your shifting and your shift at a constant speed, which is great because you don't have to bounce around your max power. Ideally, you'd shift right at your max power. So, and ideally, so after you've built slipping, speed up, shifting, you've reached your max engine RPM while you're shifting out. You know, you're limited by your engine power. You know, if you design your gear back ratio not quite right, then your peak power will be limited, could be limited by, could be limited by going out of the max power range. Um, but, you know, how often this, you know, how important that is might depend on how often you're, you're going, you know, certain speed. You know, these are some parameters we put in for us, but you know, this will be different for a lot of different designs. And because you have this CVT where you're shifting at this constant RPM, you're able to sit right on this ideal tractive, tractive force line. So, you know, choosing your gearbox ratio has less of an effect in this case because it just changes where your first gear is, but you still have, can design your CVT at the same shift point. And so and you can also see how the gearbox ratio will affect things like your acceleration time or potentially like your top speed. 
Um, then you want to keep in mind any kind of modeling, you know, the, you know, the differences you're seeing in performance uh, relative to the errors in the system are quite large. So you might use other, you know, other techniques or other things to factor in more heavily into your, into your design decision. I can mind these are just numbers for our vehicle. So far, we have talked about the linear inertia of the vehicle, as well as some of the hydraulic inertia inside your intake and exhaust systems. But we should also talk a little bit about the rotational inertia associated with your drivetrain system, as it can be quite significant. So what I'm showing over here on the right is the um, relationship for the effective uh, linear mass of your vehicle with you know, kind of your typical linear mass, the weight divided by the acceleration of gravity of your vehicle, as well as this term that accounts for all the all the components that are um, rotating uh, and fixed uh, to your to your tires. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But so this R term is the radius of the tire. This um, I term is the moment of inertia of the rotating component. And this is the ratio of how fast that component is spinning to to how fast the tire is spinning. So you can see for one example, if we look at the tires, if we assume they are um, the tires and wheels, if we assume they're discs and they have you know, roughly a uh, rotational inertia of one half their mass times their total, their outer radius squared, you'd see, and they spin at the same rate as of course as the tires, so this term is one, the radius squared cancels and you just get one half M. So you'd see, you know, for example, for a, modeling your tire as disc, they would add half their mass to the to the effective linear mass of the vehicle. And you know that's not only significant, but if you look at this term, it's actually squared. And so this actually gets much worse as you get closer and closer to your engine. As um, you know, in low gear, you might be having your engine spin uh, 30, you know, on the order of 30 times faster than your then your tire is actually spinning with you know a gear ratio of 30, you know, on the order of 30 between your engine, engine and your tire. And so this term will actually get will actually get squared. And uh, so you might have the inertia of things like you know your primary on your CVT for the, for the Baja vehicle or the input shaft on your transmission and the gears fixed to that, as well as the components rotating in your engine. Um, they might have a factor of 900, you know, 30 squared applied to their rotational inertia, which can be quite significant. And one reason for trying to minimize the rotational inertia by minimizing their mass and putting their mass as close to the axis about which they rotate. Um, and even worse part about this rotational inertia is unlike the weight of the vehicle or just the, you know, the, the mass of the vehicle, it does not add, add to the downforce. So, you know, if you added more mass on your vehicle, at least you'd get more traction and help you accelerate. But adding this rotational inertia to your system does not does not give you that effect. And so actually, you know, adding rotational inertia will have a bigger effect than adding just uh, mass on your vehicle in terms of your, in terms of your acceleration times. Um, one thing you should keep in mind, especially with these CVT systems that, you know, this addition of the rotational inertia to the effective mass of the vehicle it's only true when that component has to rotationally accelerate as your vehicle accelerates. So if you have something like your primary that's shifting and just sitting at you know, 3,200 RPM like the Baja vehicle, or you know you have your your primary is just is just slipping on the belt, or you know your engine is just sitting at a fixed RPM and just slipping on the clutch and in the formula, well then it's not going to accelerate with the tires in that case, and so then it would not add to the rotational inertia, but for all the cases where you have a component that's fixed to the tires um, and it's accelerating, that inertia would need to be, that inertia will definitely um, add to the vehicle. And it's something that I find is, you know, often overlooked by um, those are modeling, you know, the accelerations of their vehicles or when they're making design decisions uh, related to the drivetrain. So this is just a quick video. So of course, there's a lot of other things to consider. Um, Obviously, reliability in these designs and any design are really important. And it's typically will run uh, counter or you'll have to trade it off with performance. So it's always it's always a decision to be made by the team. You want to be able to troubleshoot and isolate any issues, especially with you know wiring harnesses and um, designing those so you can find the issue quickly. Drivability, we mentioned, 
you mentioned deciding about you know differentials or spools or when your driver gets back on the throttle after shifting you know is it a smooth smooth application of the torque or the wheels going to be spinning where you might be losing grip out of a turn you know minimizing the fuel efficiency so you can carry around the least amount of fuel score well in that category you know the center of gravity always being one of the key key things to try and get as low as possible as well as just you know minimize the mass you also have to think about interactions with the suspension um, any driven wheel is going to have a member go out to it and so you need to consider you know are you going to is your suspension, is your drivetrain going to limit any of the degrees of freedom of motion of the wheel? And so, um, if you're going to use U joints, then they are. If you want to use something like, you know, like a constant velocity joint, then 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 it's not going to limit one of the degrees of freedom. Uh, but that's a you know discussion that you know, your powertrain and suspension should should know. Uh, and of course, you know there's much much more to consider. But I hope this is um, informative and gets you off to a good start. Thanks for watching our video and I hope to see you out there.